my name is Emily Potis, and Vivian contacted me when she got contacted about the um, film that we just watched and said, do you think people want to watch this documentary about Roger Ailes? And I said, I want to. <laughs> um, and so it's nice that all of us are spending a Friday night together thinking about what we just watched. Um, I am just going to talk for about 15 or 20 minutes to have a little conversation. Um, this is a very brief history of propaganda. And to start with, I'm going to ask, what is propaganda? And here's the dictionary definition. Um, number one, we have the familiar definition that propaganda is information, especially of a biased or misleading nature, used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. Uh, number two is the origin of the term which is a congregation of cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church founded in 1622 by Pope Gregory XV to establish protocol for the propagation of the faith in what they would call heathen and what we would call colonized lands. Um, this is also something that is uh, formed in reaction to the Protestant Reformation. There's sort of a counter-reformation and a stepping up of what it is to be you know, Catholic and a conscious effort to get that out into the world. So uh, in Latin, uh, Congregatio di Propaganda Fide, the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, is the origin of propaganda. So you know, this is where we get the word, but what we call propaganda today has a, a deeper history. And so what I'm going to do here is just, there's a lot of different things, a lot of time periods in history, a lot of political regimes we could be talking about. Um, I'm going to simply drop a few pins in this history that I think are relevant to both my main research interest, which is sort of this intersection of religion and politics and media history in Europe, specifically Germany, um, and what we're looking at in Fox News, uh, which I think this documentary maybe didn't quite go into it, but there's a lot of subtext here that, you know, subtle white nationalism, evangelical Christianity in the form of the Tea Party and others, um, our subtext going through that sort of anger and that affect that's being brought out when people in, are watching Fox News and getting really outraged. You know, what are they getting about, outraged about? Um, well, the thing they're getting outraged about is a, is a long story that's been building for a really long time. So um, the first pin I'm going to drop is in uh, around 1750 BCE. Uh, and what we're looking at here is the Code of Hammurabi which is the world's first instance of a legal code. Uh, it's now housed at the Louvre. So this law that's carved in this, it's, a, it's, it's supposed to be a finger, <laughs> um, it, it's, it brings about many legal changes to define property laws that hadn't been defined before. And uh, it notably removes property rights from women. And also these changes come in the context of a consolidation of empire. Babylon at this time is a rising in importance from one of a number of regional city-states in Mesopotamia to an empire that's being ruled over by Hammurabi. And I bring him up because in the prologue to this code, um, which there's a quote that's listed here, um, uh, he invokes the god Marduk. Hammurabi is a, is a ruler who is the father to his subjects, just as Marduk is the father in heaven. So he's, there's a parallel, as above, so below, I'm your father ruler, he's my father ruler. So who's Marduk? Well, Marduk is the dragon-slaying hero of Enuma Elish, a Babylonian creation epic which was probably composed around this time, around the um, 18th century BCE. And what's notable about this myth, according to the people who've translated it, is that it pieces together elements of earlier stories in order to craft a narrative that justifies Marduk's triumph over earlier gods. Uh, in particular, the goddess Tiamat, who's the mother of all the gods, and also her body is the ocean. So she's like mother life, and this story is about how he is going to destroy her and then use her body to create the heavens and the earth. And as one of its translators uh, into English, Alexander Heidel, put it in the 1950s, there can be no doubt that in its present form, Enuma Elish is first and foremost a literary monument in honor of Marduk. Its prime object is to offer cosmological reasons for Marduk's advancement from the position as chief god of Babylon to that of the head 
of the entire Babylonian pantheon. And that is exactly what, and this is something that has been you know, reinforced and corroborated by more recent translators as well. Um, so that is exactly what Hammurabi wanted to do himself. Uh, so this is a sort of early example. This is one of the one of the oldest sort of pieces of writing that we actually have translated uh, that's still surviving on Earth. And so, and and when you look at it, you see this example of taking these gods who would have already been familiar to the people of the region, um, you know, and then making them sort of do what you want to do. So that it looks like what you want to do is mirrored in the heavens and so forth. Um, and if you're more interested in the story of Enuma Elish, I recently gave a paper at a conference about Jordan Peterson, and there's a whole talk about this online. But this is a dynamic that sort of pops up over and over again when it comes to state and corporate uses of religious imagery. Uh, in the year 312 CE, Constantine saw his vision of the cross. In this sign, you will conquer. Um, and this is a, a by Raphael a painting of Constantine's vision. Um, and so through Constantine's efforts, Christianity, a religion and, reli and resistance movement whose leader had been crucified by the Roman Empire three centuries prior, became the property of the emperor, Constantine's brand. So just as Hammurabi projected his imperial aspirations onto the heavens, uh, the new Christian Bible commissioned by Constantine in 331 CE reinforced a church structure that was imagined to reflect a celestial order. It's, and this is the Codex Vaticanus, which is probably you know, the oldest Bible that we, you know, of, that we know about on Earth, supposedly. It's one thing to declare ownership of the gods. It's another to propagate that belief system as far and wide as possible. Both Hammurabi and Constantine exploited the mass media equivalent of, of Fox News of their day to reach new believers. Um, now, the, the biggest reach of mass media that you have uh, for Hammurabi is Akkadian cuneiform, and it's based on steel, it's not going anywhere, and it's still in the loo. <laughs> um, for Constantine, it meant 50 identical codices hand copied by scribes and sent out into the empire so that everyone's working with the same standardized version of these books. Um, and this technology of media didn't really evolve too drastically in medieval Europe until the 15th century, um, with the arrival of the printing press in Johannes Gutenberg's workshop in Mainz. Gutenberg's Bible was among the first books published with this new technology, incorporating mass-produced movable type. Um, this is a Gutenberg Bible. And the effect of Gutenberg's Bible on German society was dramatic and swift. The printing press democratized media, providing access to multiple copies of books that were previously tightly controlled by the church, only the extremely wealthy could have them, they were tied up in monasteries, and now all of a sudden you had books, a demand for books and people who could read uh, in the sort of common, um, within a couple of generations, you had a literate populace. <clears throat> and one individual to make uh, especially make use of this technology was Martin Luther, a professor of moral theology who took issue with the materialism and opulence of the Catholic Church, especially the sale of indulgences by Pope Leo X to fund his gaudy vanity projects. So what Martin Luther did was use the printing press to produce pamphlets, not books that took forever, like months to produce, but pamphlets that could come out rel relatively quickly that combine text and image. And so there's an image there to get your attention. Uh, there's text there. It sort of has an almost ephemeral quality to it. And in this way, Luther was able to make his moral objections to the Catholic Church go viral, paving the way for other Reformation-era theologians to split off from the church in protest. And what we're looking at is the cover of a, a 1545 pamphlet by Martin Luther called Against the Papacy at Rome, Founded by the Devil. You can see how the Pope is propped up by all these demons in his hell mouth. Um, and here's a couple of images. This is sort of typical of Reformation era sick burns. On the left, <laughs> the, Pope is, the Pope is holding a flaming anti-Protestant encyclical while German peasants fart in his direction. <laughs> there's a 
whole lot of farting in this house. It's really great. <laughs> and then um, on the right, the Pope is being born, not to a human woman, but he's being suckled by like a Gorgon monster, and there's a whole family of monsters. So, um, uh, In response to Luther's propaganda campaign, the church mounted what is known as the Counter-Reformation, complete with its own propaganda, such as this image on the left as, of Luther as the seven-headed beast of Revelation. Uh, and the image on the right is uh, uh, Der Teufel's doodle sock, the devil's bagpipe, which is uh, a, a sort of a parody of the revolution, of, of the Reformation as, you know, just a bunch of bagpipes being played by Satan. <laughs> and, uh, but, the, but the Catholic Church was not the only target of Luther's scorn. This is a tract called The Jews and Their Lies, considered the world's first radically anti-Semitic tract. Um, and this is, this is like the other side of Martin Luther that must be considered along with his work as a reformer, I think, it, um, in any case. Uh, it justifies acts of violence toward Jews who refuse to convert to Christianity. 400 years after its publication, it was displayed by Nazis at their rallies in Nuremberg. So one of the best ways if you're trying to get a movement started is to have an enemy. And that enemy, uh, you know, for the, for the Nazis, extend all the way back to the Reformation. It's not something new that was materialized out of thin air. And these are two examples of Nazi propaganda blaming Jews for cultural Bolshevism, this international globalist conspiracy of socialism. Um, and for the Nazis, you know, the Jews became a symbol of everything that was corrupt about society. Um, meanwhile, the sort of heteropatriarchal German family was portrayed as natural and beautiful. Uh, Hitler's rule is divinely ordained. And um, you know, the image on the left here, you know, that the town in Ohio where Roger Ailes grew up, I feel like there's such an image of <laughs> America as this, this, this fantasy of this white traditional, um, a, a lot of you know, German and other European immigrants um, that, that settled in America have this fantasy or illusion of this, um, uh, the, the good old days, make America great again. It's like what you're really talking about is not, is not knowing about anything outside of your white supremacist enclave. Um, and I picked the image on the right because of its uh, resemblance to the image of Constantine and the sign you will conquer. Um, because like the cross, the swastika is an eye-catching design element appropriated from religious history. And Nazi rallies uh, were attractive to Roger Ailes. Uh, they resembled great religious pageants. And so like the masters of propaganda who came before him, Hitler and his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, exploited new forms of mass media to reach large audiences. Uh, especially radio addresses. Hitler would get on the radio and everyone would crowd around the radio and listen to it together as a family. And film, like Lenny Reichenstahl's Triumph of the Will. And uh, here I'm going to plug that I'm doing a lecture at Gage Academy Garden in Georgetown on January 31st on the aesthetics of fascism. We're going to talk a lot more in depth about some of these things. Um, but the term propaganda has, you know, in, in the, in the, um, original sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a department of the propagation of the faith. It doesn't have that uh, manipulative, sinister connotation, at least not if you're Catholic or you believe in the propagation of the faith. Um, and in the United States, in American history, propaganda has been sort of actively embraced as something uh, that, that, that's an aspect of cultural pride, um, uh, especially during wartime. And so here on the left, we have the character of Uncle Sam, who was first developed during the War of 1812 and endured into the 20th century as this sort of stern daddy figure, ordering young men to go enlist <laughs> in the army and pound their enemies. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, uh, well, there's you know this pro well-known uh, Rosie the Riveter and propaganda aimed at women that stresses the importance of women's work to the war effort, whether in the factory or the home. So what makes something successful as propaganda? Well, I feel like the documentary got into it a little bit, but successful propaganda really appeals to us emotionally, right, affect. We feel guilt, you know, Uncle Sam is like, you know, you gotta get in there, get in the army. Uh, moral outrage, you know, this is what these people are doing, we have to stop it. 
Uh, there's a sense of duty, a, central, a, a sense of cultural pride. Uh, if you ride alone, you're riding with Hitler. You better join the car sharing club. Uh, but but the, in America, of course, the very notion of cultural pride has always been complicated by the fact that America is a settler state uh, founded on genocide. And so as a result, not all Americans have been historically granted insider status. Uh, in his essay, what are, um, The Propaganda of History, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois points out the degree to which American history itself as taught in classrooms is a form of propaganda. Um, this history that has been falsified, as he puts it, because the nation was ashamed. Du Bois quotes Napoleon Bonaparte that history is a set of lies that have been agreed upon and then refutes the value of lies told for the sake of unity, declaring nations reel and stagger on their way they make hideous mistakes, they commit frightful wrongs, they do great and beautiful things. And shall we not best guide humanity by telling the truth about all this, so far as the truth is ascertainable? I mean, that's a very mature way to look at things, <laughs> but it depends on if you're trying to drive clicks or um, you know, mold a society, a white nationalist society. <laughs> so, um, but uh, nevertheless, I think in this documentary, you really see this um, this sort of like, there's no end to the delusions that we will believe in order to avoid that shame, that feeling the shame of truth that Du Bois just so elegantly puts it. Um, you know, there was someone on the documentary we just watched saying, if Trump didn't exist, Roger Ailes would have to engineer him in a laboratory. Uh, where does it even go after, like how much, it's like, the, you know, aristocrats, <laughs> where does it go after that? Well, um, I, I think we're actually kind of getting a sense of where it goes after that, and it's actually worse. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we know now that sort of troll campaigns have been uh, influencing elections and on social media, masquerading as real people. So we have sort of entities which we trust and treat like they're real, interacting with us, getting our feelings up. Um, and then, you know, um, YouTube. And I think just as the printing press democratized media by putting the means of production in the hands of individuals, mm -hmm. self-publishing platforms like YouTube allow us to share self-produced information on a previously inconceivable scale. Mm -hmm. In 2018, the Research Institute, Data and Society, published a report presenting data from approximately 65 political influencers to identify the so-called alternative influence network, uh, which they identify as an alternative media system that adopts the techniques of brand influencers to build audience as, and sell them political ideology. So, you know, the relationship between advertising and political um, content, you know, is writ large in Fox News, but, you know, it's, now it's completely algorithmatized. And whether it's intentionally or simply as a function of the algorithm, that uh, keeps users hooked and, and clicking, YouTube has a statistically significant habit of suggesting more and more extreme biased content to viewers. Um, for instance, just this week, a, a man here in Washington State named Bucky Wolf killed his brother, told the 9-11, or the 911 dispatcher, kill me, I can't live in this reality, and also that God had told him that his brother was a lizard person. Um, later on Twitter, an astute observer of media named Travis View analyzed the likes on Bucky Wolf's YouTube page. So revealing this sort of unsettling rabbit hole that began with him clicking on fitness and motivational videos. And then a couple months later, he gets into anti-SJW videos, social justice warriors, you know, um, which is what, some of what we're looking at here. And then uh, he gets into like Alex Jones and Milo Yiannopoulos, rebel media. And then finally he gets into the overt white nationalist content and the QAnon conspiracy theory uh, and stuff like uh, this uh, Steve's Sticks Hexenhammer thing. This is like, oh, uh, what is this, Red Ice TV. That's like a white nationalist YouTube channel. For some reason they're able to, they're just, uh, just allowed to put it up there and it's just, there's a ton of it on the internet. Um, but there's, there's this evidence, there's this sort of clicking trail that Wolf 
actually was taken through the alternative influence network in exactly the way that the report describes. Does that mean everyone who uses YouTube is going to start seeing lizard people? I don't think so, but it does reveal a very strange and specific pitfall that we as a society should be paying attention to now and not 40 years from now, where you know we're watching this documentary about Roger Ailes when it's decades too late to do anything about it. Um, so my hope with this very bare bones, highly selected presentation is to sort of open up a dialogue about how today's media is built on these sort of past currents and is in dialogue with that history, and this is where we are right now. I think this is much more crucial and critical than Fox News at the moment, which is YouTube radicalization. Um, propaganda, as I would sort of think about it, is it, it's, it's not honest up front about its own bias. You know, we come into co communication with each other, we all have our own uh, personal experiences that we bring to an interaction, but we can, we can strive to understand those and own them and um, acknowledge them, uh, or you know, look for ways to manipulate other people. And propaganda is when communication rides on these pathways of affect, emotion, outrage, worry, and desire. And so we have to be critical of how it works in order to, um, you know, we just have to be aware of it and critical of it. Uh, I, think th I think the other aspect of sort of combating this is to be active participants in creating our own counter narratives whenever possible. So we're not just consuming what's around us. Um, so anyway, this is the end of the briefest history of propaganda. And I'd love, thank you so much for sticking around.